Hi. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Minister. Thank you so much for taking your time. I can hear you very well. That's great. That's great. So let's get started. Yes. Um, before we start, is it fine if I record this? Because then I can focus on speaking. Yeah, and of course. I and and just in notes. case the vote, uh, the voice is not getting through very well, I'm recording on my side also. And at the end okay, of the interview, perfect. you can choose whether we publish this as a transcript after 10 days of editing, or maybe we upload it just to the YouTube uh, after a date that you specify. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, actually my, my plan would be to use it for a short article, so just mm -hmm. use sort of excerpts of it for an article, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, for me it's easier to, to, to have a recording because mm -hmm. then I don't need to take any, yeah, any of course, notes. Of course, yeah. Would, yeah, and I would love to, um, love to talk about two things, actually. Um, the first part would be sort of more generally about data, data protection, also the upcoming GDPR here in mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the second part, I would like to speak about AI, which is uh, what I cover mostly. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so if I, you know, that my, my first question would be next week, Europe is, um, or the GDPR will take effect mm -hmm. finally on the 25th. Um, do you believe that Europe is taking the right step with, you know, this updated set of data protection laws? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Taiwan has our Privacy uh, Act very um, closely resembles that of the previous version of the European Privacy Act. Uh, and we have also added uh, parts of it that we feel that are very important, uh, such as the user's right uh, to be empowered to interrogate the data um, operators and so on. And, and that those parts are also not just in GDPR, but further enhanced. And so we think it's totally in the in the right direction. Uh, and the National Development Council here in Taiwan has already uh, allocated a whole website section just for GDPR compliance. And we've worked with all the relevant ministries to publish guidelines uh, for GDPR compliance. So we're totally um, supporting it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, I believe it's called PIPA, right? The, the acronym of your, your own uh, Data Protection Act from 2010 originally, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. That, that's exactly um, right, yes. Yeah, when it, so when it comes to this act, um, I, I mean, you know, data protection is something that's in flux and mm -hmm. these rules need to be constantly updated and mm -hmm. so on. Um, would you say that, you know, in future revisions of your own act, mm -hmm. you, you might draw inspiration from mm -hmm. the European approach because it is very comprehensive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, um, there are, of course, exceptions uh, to uh, the privacy guarantees and different jurisdictions emphasize different things, right? So I think all of us encourage academic use, but for some European countries, there are exceptions made for historical research, uh, for the archivists and the histo historiography. But uh, we don't uh, make an exception for the history uh, people here. But instead, we make exceptions for, for example, criminal uh, statisticians and criminal investigation and things like that. So, so there are different social norms, is what, what we're saying. But there are uh, parts of it, such as data portability uh, and um, the other uh, more technical aspects of it, that we're already uh, installing on a regulation level. Uh, not necessarily on a law level, but already on a regulation level. And I think GDPR is a great uh, opportunity for us to choose parts of things that we already do on regulation level and on our next uh, law revision, uh, put it in. And also in addition, for example, uh, the Data Protection Authority, uh, at the moment, each ministry in Taiwan is a DPA uh, for all the commercial entities registered under that ministry. Uh, that's usually not a problem. But for uh, platform economy and more companies, we are seeing that uh, one operator may fall under the jurisdiction of multiple agencies or ministries. So some harmonization of that uh, is great. Um, and we're seeing that in Japan also, they used to have each ministry acting as DPA, but now they also have a central agency uh, in charge of harmonizing the different interpretations of uh, data protection laws within all the different ministries. So the National Development Council is now also uh, taking charge of that, and we're um, kind of reshaping the, the Department for Information Management uh, into potentially the Department for Digital um, Development uh, so that it can be more uh, kind of a oversight of all the different ministries. So, so we see it as a positive opportunity. <laughs> 
it's there's um, there's talk here in Europe about the GDPR potentially becoming a model for the world mm -hmm. um, for data protection. Mm -hmm. What's your what's your reaction to this? How do, how do you mm -hmm. feel? could could it be a sort of a a role model? Uh, well, I mean, there's parts of the GDPR uh, that I think um, are very advanced and that we should definitely uh, learn about. I think in particular the requirement for the data operator to re uh, to explain uh, in understandable terms uh, instead of you know just a request to explain at all in any technical terms. I think that is a real innovation and that's the one that I personally feel very important and I could call that a model of the world. <laughs> uh, um, but um, I think there's other parts that we will have to uh, adjust based on the social norms here. For example, in, in Taiwan, um, the special sensitive uh, personal data, uh, we have actually more strict protection uh, than the GDPR one. Uh, for example, the medical records, uh, health records, genetic information, uh, and also criminal records and things like that, we are actually putting into a much more stricter provision. And so we're not uh, looking at GDPR and say we can relax those, right? So, so they are part of it that we, we need to harmonize uh, within our practice. But generally, I would say it's on the, on the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm slowly now shifting towards AI, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, and and I mean of course you know uh, data and AI are closely mm -hmm. related. AI doesn't work mm -hmm. without data. There was um, the last month the European Union uh, released its own strategy on AI, mm -hmm. and in a nutshell, you know, sort of summarize in a nutshell what 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 the EU said it's like its idea is to become a leader when it comes to ethics mm -hmm. of AI mm -hmm. and to sort of preserve fundamental rights along with the rise of AI and you know that the idea is that this will make the continent competitive mm -hmm. in the global race where right now we have the US leading but China catching up very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, wait, um, first question is like how, what, what do you think about that this approach? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think um, any any public discussion is a good thing because the the scenario that we don't want to see is that AI researchers stop publishing and start you know working in cabals and conspiracies. That would be <laughs> to the detriment of everyone, right? So so we want to encourage AI researchers to work in the open and to work out AI safety and um, ethic norms uh, with the whole society, with the, all the stakeholders. And in fact, this just this week uh, we're going to push a new legislation to our parliament. It's called the AI Mobility Sandbox. And um, I see that Germany is uh, setting a kind of AI ethic for autonomous vehicles uh, that puts human first, animal second, <laughs> right? And, and some um, uh, very interesting uh, ideas about non-discrimination of any race and ethnicity and things like that when it considers human life and so on, which I think are very good guidelines, but in reality, what people care about is not uh, only such top-down um, philosophical guidelines, but very practical thing like uh, when a uh, AI-driven vehicle runs into something, not necessarily people, when it runs into a building, for example, how do we uh, interrogate uh, that vehicle and see the world from its perspective so that it can communicate uh, with people? And this process, we already have a web it. It's, it's called domestication, right? Uh, but uh, I think... Uh, just like the wolves and uh, earlier humans co-domesticated each other, so become modern dogs and modern human. Uh, we also need a way for the uh, early AI vehicles to not just be subject to some top-down ethic standard, which is important, I'm sure, but also uh, interrogate its integration into the society. Case in the example is that, um, for example, the MIT Media Lab has this class called Persuasive Electronic Vehicles, or PEVs, and they're automatic vehicles, but they're tricycles. They are very slow driving tricycles, but it can still carry cargo and it can still carry people. Um, and we have that because it's using the right of two roads just as pedestrians. We have that running around Taipei in the Social Innovation Lab and we recorded a lot of interaction of these vehicles with people uh, because it's slow enough, it, if it runs into people it doesn't really hurt anyone. Uh, we were able to gather because it's open source and all the data is shared, uh, we were able to have the local university college students 
tweak uh, it so that we can try various different ways for it to signal its intentions and for the human to signal its intentions and maybe merge the worldview so that we can view a playback of the incident from the vehicle's viewpoint and so on. And we were able to do that because Taiwan is a place that values experiments. And I think um, in the AI mobility sandbox, what we're doing is that we'll have the local regional governments uh, declare their social need that could be fulfilled by a limited testing of AI vehicles and it's not just driving but it could be ships, it could be drones and then uh, but slowly uh, maybe under a speed limit or something uh, to experiment with the business model but the important thing is not some top-down rules but for the society through this kind of experimentation gain a first-hand understanding of how to uh, commit co-domesticate with AIs and then write up such multi-stakeholder um, opinions and, and reflections into something that could in turn inform the interaction design of the um, vehicles so that they can explain themselves and integrate better. So what I'm say, trying to say is that with the AI mobility sandbox, we're taking a grassroots approach instead of a few legislators and few theoreticians and a few computer science ministers, um, that's me, <laughs> declaring uh, that such and such thing is good and ethical from an AI standpoint. We're going to using a slow speed limited area sandbox and for the um, society to, to work out uh, with the individual vendors and at the end of the experiment if it's declared a good for society we'll just incorporate part of it into the regulation and if it's not a good idea well at least it doesn't really hurt anyone and uh, we can demand uh, extra uh, restrictions of the future experimentation so we already have some success with the fintech sandbox with AI banking right so now we think AI mobility should be the next sandbox after the AI banking one Hmm. Um, I'll get back to this in one second, but I want to ask one other question. If mm -hmm. you know, if you look at sort of the global landscape when mm -hmm. it comes to artificial intelligence at the mm -hmm. moment, you have the U.S., which is still leading, and the U.S. follows traditionally a very business-centered approach, mm -hmm. where the expertise is with the big tech companies. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of that's, that's where it happens. We have China, which mm -hmm. wants to catch up very quickly and follows. You mm -hmm. know, provides companies with data. It's mm -hmm. also built you know, what I would describe as a surveillance state. Mm -hmm. And then Europe that wants to play, wants to come up with this third path, mm -hmm. um, where they say, you know, we need to be sort of a, a place where people know that their data is being, you know, used safely, where they, mm -hmm. they can still come to that. Um, in this sort of like tableau of three different kind of broader, where do you see, where do you see Taiwan? Well, I, th I think it's an oversimplification because I just returned from, uh, the the valley and I talk with the open AI folks and the open AI as you know is a charity and uh, its explicit goal is to work out safety uh, loss for the generalized artificial intelligence and I would not say that they are profit driven at all that they, they were uh, all very um, interesting uh, AI researchers trying out all the different branches trying to reach generalized artificial intelligence before a maliciously uh, intent uh, actors do so um, and I think their charter uh, there's part of their charter I think uh, can still use some um, more conversation and explore more deeply uh, because the regulatory co-creation I think is very important but I think their open air charter strikes a pretty good balance uh, between what you said as human rights um, interests and the private sector interests. So I, I don't think they're necessarily competing with each other. Uh, I mean, the, the US and the Europe uh, approaches. Uh, I, I will, will not comment about the compatibility uh, between the surveillance approach and the other approaches. <laughs> so I think in Taiwan, because my um, domain is not just digital, but it's also open government, social innovation, and especially social entrepreneurship, uh, what I always try to um, um, encourage in, in the constituents and also in the civil society is to not think about um, human rights or environmental causes or any other social justice as opposite to um, profit or to business uh, or commercial interests. Uh, with the right design of social entrepreneurship, you can use the for-profit motive for social good um, you, with the like the B Corp movement and other movements. So I think uh, AI only takes off if there are incentives from all the stakeholders to not just share the data, but also publish uh, what whatever they learn. Because frankly speaking, there is no generalized theory at the moment guiding the, the field of AI. Um, it's, it's just 
random, uh, I would say random walk <laughs> from all the different kind of applications and trying to solve uh, practical issues. And that's not necessarily applying uh, to the field that it's experimenting, but sometimes, you know, just playing Go or playing Amiga games can carry over to some other field. <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to say is that we, we have to align carefully the, the social benefits and the private sector for-profit motives, which is why why Taiwan's uh, AI plan, which is in AI taiwan.gov.tw um, uh, strikes a balance by saying we are going to have the small and medium enterprises uh, find out which part of their work can be automated and that's obviously a commercial motive but then for the academia and the people uh, working on research to try to as part of solving this problem also find out ways that social innovation that's to the uh, benefit of everybody through regulatory co-creation so uh, with the industry proposing solutions uh, and uh, academia and the civil society refining the solutions to be acceptable by the uh, general public. I think we have to strike a, a balance between the private and the civil society interest. And I think that is actually what most of the large companies that I have interviewed with, uh, like Microsoft or Google, is doing anyway. They they because of partly GDPR, but also because of a collective uh, awareness of the potential damage that AI can do to the human uh, society. You you see that once they roll out AI product, they very quickly rush to say, oh by the way, Google Duplex will declare itself as a bot, and it will refine <laughs> its interaction uh, so that it can integrate with human society without deception and things like that. And we don't usually see that kind of prefixes uh, in the previous product announcement. So that to me is a signal that they're also taking this balanced approach. Yeah. Um, speaking about this, you you recently, you as in Taiwan, the country, mm -hmm. um, managed to attract a couple of American companies oh, yeah. to, uh, mm -hmm. to to come to come to Taiwan and um, mm -hmm. and um, open up their own AI divisions there. That's right. Um, and so this is, um, I mean, I understand a lot of the expertise is there. Here in Europe, we, we have a similar phenomenon here with them opening their divisions here and there. Politicians here, um, lawmakers who are concerned about a brain drain on our own territory, if you mm. will, so that you know that that talent is going to the U.S. company, so that the, mm -hmm. a lot of the expertise mm -hmm. still remains with them. Is that something that you are concerned about? Well, um, I see AI mostly just like the invention of fire. <laughs> the more democratized it, the more safe it is. It, it's true. Mm -hmm. If it's just a handful of people in a society can use it and everybody else treat it as a black box, then we run the risk of a lot of social catastrophe uh, because of people's misuse. But it's just like fire, right? It's dangerous, it has burned entire cities. But we, we teach how to use fire um, in a safe and responsible way uh, from when people are like four years old or five years old, right? It's part of the cooking class. So what, what I'm trying to say is that we're in our K-12 curriculum, we're explicitly saying AI, access to ICT, media literacy, critical thinking. It's not just some two hour or four hour class that all the students must go through. It is actually to be ingrained into all the different fields so that the students see AI as just a another tool uh, to, to simplify their, their life while being very critically thinking about uh, biases and, and other things when they learn all the different disciplines. It's not just for their computer science uh, discipline and we have integrated into the curriculum starting next year. So what I'm trying to say is that if there are many AI researchers doing cutting-edge research in Taiwan, I think it will um, increase the public discourse on AI because we will have thousands of people who are knowledgeable enough about it who can participate in our democratic process. And once uh, the K-12 people and all the children in Taiwan, because broadband is a human right here, uh, have easy access to GPU computing or other AI computing <clears throat> clusters, uh, I think this this is actually what uh, causes the reverse of the brain drain, right? It is causing that everybody is becoming AI aware. And I think in a few years, we will not think about AI as some very special thing. It will just be part of the automation, uh, just like office automation. It was treated as something magical, but, but now it is just uh, part of the life. Hmm. That's, very, that's very interesting. Also, the analogy with the fire. I have two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, one would be um, that is sort of looking at the U.S. There was um, the White House held um, an AI summit last last week, and um, from what I heard from my U.S. colleagues, the the administration, the Trump administration, signaled to the companies that 
they um, that they you know won't regulate massively at this point in time mm -hmm. because they say for for AI to foster growth there should be little regulation at mm -hmm. this point. Um, what do you think? Is that the right approach? Should there be regulation? How much regulation should there be for AI at this point? No, as I said, um, I, I think the model is for co-regulation, right? So, or regulatory co-creation. Um, and so if a company come to us saying, you know, AI banking is currently outlawed by the, the you know, fintech laws of the financial minister, instead of saying you were doing a light touch or we were doing a heavy touch, we instead say, okay, write up exactly where does our regulations have hampered your growth and have a multi-stakeholder panel look into it as long as you don't cross some red lines like I don't know uh, funding the terrorists or money laundering you can't do experimentation of that <laughs> but other than those things you can do an experimentation that challenge the existing laws and regulations without the regulators and the lawmakers have to commit one way or the other we can through six months of um, experimentation have everybody affected by this new AI banking service or very soon AI mobile service uh, determining whether it's a good idea or not. Uh, I think um, it's also part of what we just call the media literacy or AI literacy idea because if it's co-regulated with the civil society, everybody learns a little bit about how the machine views the world. But if it is just a handful of regulators, then everybody ends up none the wiser. So, so I think it is easy to say that uh, we need to uphold some standards on freedom, on freedom of expression, assembly, and freedom from surveillance, from coercion, and from censorship. But other than those basic freedoms, I think all the norms uh, of interacting with AI cannot be done in a broad brush. It has to uh, be very specific to specific AI implementations and specific to a county even, uh, and on how the people there want to react. And maybe the county nearby doesn't want to react the same way, which is great. I think there is a lot of diversity of how to incorporate um, domestic animals even <laughs> into human populations and we should use a very similar um, analogy when incorporating AI into everyday life of people especially if they're upgrading from an assisting role to an autonomous role. My last question would be you know again sort of looking back at um, at Taiwan and Europe um, where, where do you see very broadly speaking um, for AI where do you see the potential for mm. Taiwan and Europe to cooperate. Right. Uh, I, I think uh, in Taiwan, the research into AI, uh, AI safety uh, and AI, um, tr what we call trust, trustable AI, explainable AI, interpretable AI, there's a lot of interest in it. But uh, I think um, not just GDPR, but the recent uh, declarations, I think uh, it provides a model because, for example, if German has passed a certain law that translates into algorithm uh, on the automakers doing self-driving cars in Germany, then with our AI mobility sandbox, we don't have to start from scratch, right? We can incorporate those same algorithmic um, oversight and accountability into our co-creation system and start from where Germany has started. So we're not seeing any competition between those uh, norms because essentially this is codifying our social expectations, not uh, usually into law anymore, <laughs> but into code, right? And, and code has the the property that it transcends jurisdictions. Uh, you can take the same code and compile it into different languages and different regulations. Even that part is being taken care of by AI. So I think at the end, we will uh, have a set of abstract uh, code and algorithm and parameters, and our regulatory co-creation will be the society's tuning of those parameters and hyperparameters, but the end result will be shareable uh, among all the different jurisdictions. And for example, just take a, another non-AI example, just recently uh, the Ministry of Transportation and Communication here has regulated that uh, shared uh, driving uh, and so a uh, coupling is limited to like two times uh, to commute and commute back. And if you start charging people for those two trips, you're still carpooling. But if you're doing it more than two times a day, then from the third time onward, you're essentially doing, you know, a Uber-like <laughs> rental car service, and and you you start being uh, eligible for taxation and whatever above the third uh, trip. And I can easily imagine that in other jurisdictions in Europe, using the European platform economy laws, it's not two trips but four trips or whatever. But but I think the the structure of the argument will be the same, and so we will be able to co-create on the um, 
code-based um, norms uh, that the society can opt in or opt out and tune the parameters like two chips or four chips. And we're going to see very much the same thing uh, about AI banking and AI mobility and other applications. Minister, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, this was really, really helpful. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you also. I know it's late in Taiwan already, so thank you for... <laughs> no, 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 it's just great. Yeah. So, so... You know, I, yeah. My, yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to, um, actually, I want to publish it as fast as possible. Sure, sure. Um, but sure. I, it's, it's not entirely in my hands, but no, my editors fine. in Brussels. But I, I will mm -hmm. keep you updated. I will send you an email as soon as I know. A mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be out this week. This is really mm -hmm. my, my right, goal. Right, so after it's published, would you, would you mind if we just publish this YouTube video? No, absolutely. Okay, you can, okay. Yeah, of course. Sure, for sure. Right, right. So, so, so I'll post it as an unlisted video, so it's not uh, searchable by anyone else. Uh, I'll paste mm -hmm. you the link and you can review it. And once the article is published, you just let me know and we'll flip it into public. Okay, that okay. sounds great. That sounds really good. Okay. Thank you very much for your time right, and you know, you have a great day. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you.